Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery, and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? I'd like to thank Catherine Pear for researching and writing up today's case. This is The Sirloin Stockade Murders. On the night of July 16, 1978, 16-year-old Carlos Joy pulled into the parking lot of the Sirloin Stockade restaurant located on the corner of Southwest 74th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. His girlfriend, Terry Horst, was a server at the popular chain restaurant, and Carlos was waiting to drive her home after her shift. Carlos briefly entered the restaurant and spoke to Terry before grabbing a Coke and returning to his car where he listened to the radio and watched cars pass on Interstate 240. Around 10.30 p.m., Carlos noticed that all the lights in the parking lot were shutting off until the only light remaining on was inside the restaurant. Bored of waiting, Carlos drove around the parking lot to pass time. As he reached the opposite side of the building, he noticed a green Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser station wagon parked beside the dumpsters but he didn't see anyone inside. He then returned to the front of the building and approached the door of the restaurant, finding it unlocked, which was unusual after closing time. Upon entering, Carlos did not see or hear anyone. He assumed that the employees might have been having a meeting, but the silence made him uneasy, and he wondered if something more was going on. Feeling spooked, he returned to the car and cranked up his CB radio speaker, this is the police. We have you surrounded, his voice rang out through the speaker box. Carlos waited, but didn't see or hear anything. So he entered the building once more, this time calling out for Terry, and again, he received no response. Suddenly, a phone began to ring in the back office. Carlos was sure that an employee would answer the phone, but no one did, and it just continued to ring. At this point, Carlos really knew that something was seriously wrong. Fearing that a robber might still be in the building, he turned to leave. As he made his way to the door, it opened, and the store's manager, Michael Click, walked in. Click asked Carlos if he was the only person in the restaurant and explained that no one had called in for the receipts, which was a usual part of the closing shift, so Michael had decided to come to the restaurant to see if something was wrong. Carlos told him that he thought the employees might be in the back. Click went to the back of the restaurant and returned a few moments later, visibly shaken. He picked up the phone on the counter to call the police and told Carlos that everyone was in the freezer. Someone must have come in here and beat them up, he said. As Click spoke to the 911 dispatcher, Carlos decided to head to the back of the store to see for himself. As he approached the doorway of the walk-in freezer, he could see all six of the employees were strewn amongst the boxes, each in a pool of blood. It was clear that they had actually been shot, not beaten. When police and paramedics arrived, they checked for signs of life. 40-year-old Louis Zacharias, 56-year-old Isaac Freeman, 17-year-old David Lindsay, 17-year-old Anthony Two, and 16-year-old David Salzman were all declared deceased at the scene. The sixth victim, Carlos's girlfriend, 16-year-old Terry Horst, was still alive but barely clinging to life. Horst was rushed to Oklahoma Children's Memorial Hospital, but unfortunately died before reaching an operating room. An initial search of the crime scene revealed that approximately $1,290 was taken from the safe. The only evidence that had been left behind were the spent bullets and a handful of coins that they likely dropped as they fled the building. Laboratory tests run on the ammunition would reveal that the shots were fired from two different pistols, with nine shots being fired in all. This helped investigators determine that there had likely been more than one killer. In the days following the massacre, members of the Oklahoma City Police Department worked with the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, and the Oklahoma Highway Patrol to try to find the perpetrators. Investigators quickly found that this crime had a familiar tone. Approximately three weeks before the massacre, a family of three had been murdered near Purcell, Oklahoma. Melvin Lorenz, Linda Lorenz, and their 12-year-old son were en route from Texas to Oklahoma to attend a funeral for Melvin's mother. 
The perpetrators had robbed the couple before shooting and killing all three members of the family and dumping their bodies on the side of the highway. A witness came forward in that case, claiming to have seen a vehicle matching the Lorenz's vehicle and the people who were driving it. The description provided by the witness enabled law enforcement to create and release composite sketches of the suspects. Authorities were convinced that there was a link between the Lorenz murders and the six employees at the Sirloin Stockade. That suspicion would be confirmed when a small child in Northeast Oklahoma City discovered a bag containing three revolvers, at least one of which had been used in the Steakhouse murders and another that had been owned by Melvin Lorenz. On January 3, 1979, the OSBI received an anonymous phone call from a man who said that he was a trucker and claimed to have partied with two of the individuals in the sketches. He identified those individuals as Verna and Harold Stafford. Unbeknownst to investigators, the caller was actually the third suspect in the sketches and brother of Harold, Roger Dale Stafford. This drunken phone call would prove to be a pivotal moment in the investigation as authorities had no names prior to this. Now that authorities had identified two of the three suspects, they began tracking them down. They would pick up the trace of Harold Stafford in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they discovered that he had been killed in a motorcycle accident just six days after the murders at the Sirloin Stockade. According to an employee at the funeral home, a woman had shown up and identified herself as Harold's wife. Investigators were able to track her all the way to Chicago, where she was working in an office with Verna Stafford, the female suspect in the composite sketches. Verna Stafford disclosed the whereabouts of her husband, Roger Dale Stafford, and the pair were taken back to Oklahoma to face charges for the murders. Verna wasted no time in implicating her husband and his brother, Harold, both in the murders of the Lorenz family and the employees at the Sirloin Stockade. She claimed that the three of them had traveled to Oklahoma to commit robberies so they would have enough money to obtain a place to live for Roger, Verna, and their children, and for Harold to obtain money for his girlfriend to get an abortion. A recent change in law back at that time allowed an individual to testify against their spouse, and Verna Stafford eagerly did so in October of 1979. Roger pled not guilty to the Sirloin House slayings, but his wife, Verna, gave detailed testimony. According to Verna, although it was supposed to originally be a robbery and nothing more, the assistant manager had taunted Roger, saying that he couldn't understand why people couldn't work for their own money instead of taking from others. She said he then ordered all six of the employees into the freezer and summoned his brother. She said that Harold was hesitant and remarked that no one was supposed to get hurt. Roger replied that they would get what they deserve. In the end, Harold gave in to Roger's demands. Verna also claimed that her husband forced her to hold one of the guns and made her squeeze the trigger. On October 17, 1979, 27-year-old Roger Dale Stafford was convicted on all counts and was sentenced to death. A few months later, in February of 1980, he was also tried and convicted for the murders of the Lorenz family and received another death sentence. Verna pled guilty to two counts of second-degree murder as part of a plea agreement and received a sentence of 10 years to life. However, she would seek resentencing in 1989, hoping to be released. After listening to testimony, Oklahoma County District Judge Richard Freeman chose instead to impose the maximum sentence, giving her two consecutive life terms. Quote, I would wager that there's one of the hottest corners of hell vacant with your name right above it, he told her. Verna Stafford remains incarcerated at the Mabel Bassett Correctional Facility in McLeod, Oklahoma, where she will remain for the rest of her life. After more than 15 years on death row, marked by a couple of stays of execution and a handful of failed appeals, Roger Dale Stafford was put to death on July 1, 1995. Several days after his execution, Assistant Attorney General Sandy Howard received a $5 gift certificate to the Sirloin Stockade. On the back was the message, Hey, you got away with it. I am murdered and you helped do it. I am innocent and you know it. Below the message was Roger's signature and his inmate number. 
The massacre at the Sirloin Stockade was the worst crime in Oklahoma history up until that point. Former Oklahoma County District Attorney Andy Coates stated, The only thing you can say is that a terrible crime was committed. The person who committed it was apprehended, prosecuted, convicted, and executed. That's the way the system is supposed to work. Case cracked. I would like to thank Oklahoman.com, TheOdysseyOnline.com, OSCN.net, WebArchive.org, and Wikipedia.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Catherine Pear for researching and writing up this case. Joining me now is Christy Arnhart to discuss it with us. Well, Christy, the DA, Andy Coates, um, put it pretty well in that final statement there. This is a terrible, terrible crime. It is. I mean... They took so many lives for so little money. Yeah. I mean, these kids were just starting their lives. It was just heinous what they did. Yeah. 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 I really don't understand um, a robbery of that nature and then letting it go to that place. And then the excuse being that he was basically kind of goaded into it because, you know, the assistant manager made some comment or something. It's. And that was know. ridiculous. Yeah. They're trying to blame it on the victim. Mm -mm. Well, if it was an isolated occurrence, maybe I would maybe I would buy that reasoning or excuse. What did the Lorenz family do? What did they say something to him too, along the similar lines? Like you know, this mm -hmm. there's a precedence here. So how's that excuse supposed to work? I I don't know. But, yeah, I thought about that myself. Yeah. And I mean, this <clears throat> for Oklahoma. I mean, this was a major thing. Yeah. It was the first in a lot of different things. It was the first mass murder in Oklahoma. Mm. And it was one of the first trials, if not the first, that took place in Oklahoma County where a camera was allowed in the courtroom. And I meant that would have, yeah, for the mm. people in Oklahoma, I'm sure that was something. Yeah, yeah. Well, and especially if you're going for something like the death penalty, like to to actually get public perception and kind of sway on that Um but thinking about that, about the camera, just makes me wonder about, you know, uh, if, if this would have happened in modern times, like how would technology have really helped with this case? I mean, first of all, cameras, like they would have had cameras there. I mean, mm -hmm. thankfully, this isn't a case that went on decades before it was solved because we had one of the criminals kind of bumble into giving themselves up. Mm -hmm. um, cell phone tracking, like there's so many different things that could have helped this. But I say that and... We covered a case on the channel just a few weeks ago about the Lane Bryant murders that was decades after this mm -hmm. and was kind of mired by the same issues. And we even had more current technology then, but we were still talking about a retail establishment where they didn't have cameras. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, but back to the point that we were starting with about how this feels out of whack. Like you're you're robbing a place for $1,000, which admittedly in the ni late 1970s, that's a lot of money. But yeah. Um, I've got this thing where I almost feel like it's got like natural born killer vibes on it. Like, you know, they went and they killed this family and they, they, you know, took their stuff and then, oh, now they're going to this restaurant and they're just going to rob it. Oh, no, no, we're going to have to kill everyone. It's got this kind of nonchalant approach to life and disregard of life that mm -hmm. I'm really, really troubled by. And it's almost like poetic justice that we have verna go and ask to be released first of all that she makes a, a plea agreement which basically gives her a reduced sentence yeah but that's not enough she goes and asks to be released out of that and effectively gets herself <laughs> the stiffer maximum penalty two life terms like it's it's just crazy mm -hmm. to me and i i think it speaks to that that gross disregard of life that both mm -hmm. of the cases that are part of this show uh, and I'm just glad that they picked up on that. Well, me too. And I, it wasn't just you, actually. There were some investigators and members of the FBI who said that they felt this was more a joy killing than anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it certainly seems like it. It seems like it these does. people were just... Or, you know, we, we talk frequently about, like, the fantasy that some criminals will get caught up in. Like, it, really, their, their fantasy is they're going to go rob a bunch of places and then they'll be able to afford a place of their own. Like for uh, the whole thing is just what kind of whacked out conversation is this where you got three people sitting around saying, yeah, let's go, we'll go rob and kill people. And then we can rent an apartment or buy a house or like, what's the, I don't know. I don't know what the goal mm. is with all that, but mm, they all bother me so much. Yeah. And then you get the thing with the gift card at the end. And 
I'm pretty sure they got the right people here. Uh, mm -hmm. Those composite sketches are kind of amazing. Like the the likeness, especially mm -hmm. the side by sides, it's it's pretty on the nose. Um, but there was one little wrinkle that I ran into when looking into this a bit more, and that's mm -hmm. the person that the gift card was sent to, uh, Assistant Attorney General Sandy Howard, mm -hmm. and they actually ran into some other controversy that might just add a sprinkle of doubt because you know we we do have this guy saying hey you killed me I, I was innocent um in 2001 at a clemency hearing for a condemned inmate named wanda jean allen allen's attorney was trying to prove that she was actually mentally challenged and she had an iq of around 69. sandy howard told the parole board that allen actually not only graduated high school but also earned a two-year college certificate so obviously that's that's showing that they're probably fine. Um, but in actuality, Alan had dropped out of school at the age of 15. She was also evaluated as part of her trial process in 1995 and found to have convincing evidence of cognitive and sensory motor deficits and brain dysfunction, all possibly linked to a head injury when she was an adolescent. When, oh. when criticized about this, so Sandy Howard's response is, well, this information came from Wanda's own testimony. But if we are talking about someone that is dealing with mental issues, like, yes, even if they are sworn, if it's their sworn testimony, can you just take that at face value? Should you have done a little fact checking on that? Put a put an investigator on it and go suss that out. So, yeah, basically, Sandy Howard kind of gets this big public outcry of like, wow. You know, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And basically you have someone fighting for their life to not face the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're saying that information's wrong and you're actually wrong. Uh, ultimately, Man. yeah, ultimately Wanda Jean Allen's application for clemency would be denied. And she was given the death penalty in January of 2001. So just a little sprinkle of a question. Like I said, I think they got the right person. And I think that was just just his way of kind of trying to throw, you know, sand in their eye on, on his way out. Just like, Oh, you know that I'm innocent and you guys did this anyway. Um, I don't know. Those composite sketches are, are pretty, pretty compelling to me. And honestly, mm -hmm. how often do you hear me say that? Like when it comes to that type of information, I'm <laughs> usually kind of like, okay, half trust it, but these, these were really well done. Yes, they were. And I agree with you. I've really, he must've just sent that to mess with everybody. Yeah. Uh, well and the yeah. media that he used like he could have written a letter like he could have put it on paper like he sends it on a gift card for the yeah. steakhouse yeah like, it's kind of got a weird message once again just this disregard for the situation just all over it but anyway it's just so sad all yeah, around it is it is it's it's tragic and to think that you know all these six seven families in total just losing loved ones like that and having to go through the years carrying the pain of Oh yeah, we're attached to that that bad thing that happened in our home state. For, for I mean, one time. of those girls had to be taken to Children's. She was young enough. Yeah, it, yeah. No, they they justice prevailed. They got the right people. Yeah, I believe so. Once again, a big thank you to Catherine Pear for researching and writing this up. And Christy, thank you for helping me dissect all of it a bit more. I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Brandy Fry and Amanda Beard. Since 2015, we have always run limited commercial ads for the benefit of the viewers and the families that we're trying to help. Obviously, we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Candace Allison recently did. We really appreciate your support on our mission to run as few ads as possible and help as many cases as we can. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below so you never miss an upload. Also, if you'd like to catch one of our weekly live secret studio shows, be sure to check the description box below for our new channel link, Lord and Art Studio 2. After several years, we are going to be ending Case Cracked. You won't want to miss the final episode next week where we discuss cases that were helped by pets. Of course, I'll also be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arch channel. <laughs>